Now, in the cases that you have brought, it sounds like you've had some success in those cases. What are the biggest roadblocks in the litigation? What are the difficulties you usually encounter in those cases? Well, most of the cases I've, I've done are, yeah, the facts are clear. Mm -hmm. The law is clear. Right. And uh, the biggest obstacles are the, the law firms that represent the companies that will not surprisingly use every procedural uh, device, every uh, possible mechanism to delay uh, uh, any kind of hearing or trial on the merits. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the term papering to death comes to mind. Right. Um, you know, I found that aggressive uh, discovery uh, it, it is important in, in succeeding. I mean, you file a complaint uh, and start taking depositions. I prefer to take depositions before the other side really knows where you're coming from. For example, in, in one of the cases, uh, mountaintop removal cases, uh, the first person I, uh, I uh, deposed was the, the uh, company's land agent. Actually, he had a subsidiary land holding company that was dealing with the purchase of, of houses. And uh, uh, I asked him, do you budget for the buying people's homes? And uh, he said, well, yeah, we, we had a meeting. So I said, so beforehand you knew that there were going to be external impacts of your money, and, it, and it's in your annual budget. So, well, yeah. And uh, I said, well, you know, how do you determine how much to budget? And he said, well, and we've got a we've got a map, and we have three priorities. Uh, and I said, well, I'd like to see the map. And, and I got we got the map, and it's called the target acquisition map. It had three different priorities closest to the mine, you know, where they're going to have the most adverse impact. Right. So they knew in advance. They planned for it. They budgeted uh, for this. So it was absolutely intentional. Um, and uh, and that kind of that discovery early on uh, made it, uh, the litigation successful. I mean, it's successful in the terms that people were able to get out. Right. No, and without signing those agreements, uh, but unsuccessful in the sense that uh, communities like the one I mentioned, Monclo or Blair, don't exist anymore. You know that, that Blair had several thousand people in the height of, of uh, uh, coal production, uh, and it doesn't exist anymore. And, and let me add one other interesting aspect. Uh, the uh, when the companies would buy the houses, at least in several situations, the houses would mysteriously burn down. So my one client lived in a place called Fly, Five Block near Blair, and she had 20 neighbors. And by the time I went to see her and, and talk about representing her. Uh, there were only about four neighbors left, and all the other houses and trailers had been burned down. They were owned by the company, and they just left the, the burned ruins there. It's an incentive to move out. <laughs> it is an incentive to move out. And when I, I deposed the land agent, I said, what do you, how do you protect those houses right. from uh, from arson, they claim it was arson. Uh, we believe that the company had people doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the land agent said, well, uh, we locked the doors. I said, well, you could use motion lights. Well, yeah, but that would cost some money. Uh, the, you got security guards at the office that protect the mine, and that's only a mile away. And use those? Well, no, but we called the sheriff once. Uh, 
but that gives you a flavor of, uh, of, the, of the kind of disrespect that coal field communities sometimes experience. I'm not saying every coal company does right. that, right. but uh, we're talking about major, some of the biggest producers of coal in the United States were the, involved in using those techniques to rid themselves of, of their neighbors. 